When we arrived at Genishau, the Indians of that tribe were making active preparations for joining the French in order to assist them in retaking Fort Niagara, as Fort Niagara was called in the Seneca language, from the British, who had taken it from the French in the month preceding. They marched off the next day after our arrival, painted and accoutred in all the habiliments of Indian warfare, determined on death or victory, and joined the army in season to assist in accomplishing a plan that had been previously concerted for the destruction of a part of the British army. The British feeling themselves secure in the possession of Fort Nigo, and unwilling that their enemies should occupy any of the military posts in that quarter, determined to take Fort Schlosser, lying a few miles up the river from Nigo, which they expected to effect with but little loss. Accordingly, a detachment of soldiers, sufficiently numerous, as was supposed, was sent out to take it, leaving a strong garrison in the fort, and marched off, well prepared to effect their object. But on their way they were surrounded by the French and Indians, who lay in ambush to deceive them, and were driven off the bank of the river into a place called the Devil's Hole, together with their horses, carriages, artillery, and everything pertaining to the army. Not a single man escaped being driven off, and of the whole number one only, was fortunate enough to escape with his life. Our Indians were absent but a few days, and returned in triumph, bringing with them two white prisoners and a number of oxen. Those were the first neat cattle that were ever brought to the Genesee Flats. The next day after their return to Genishau was set apart as a day of feasting and frolicking at the expense of the lives of their two unfortunate prisoners on whom they purposed to glut their revenge and satisfy their love for retaliation upon their enemies. My sister was anxious to attend the execution and to take me with her to witness the customs of the warriors as it was one of the highest kind of frolics ever celebrated in their tribe and one that was not often attended with so much pomp and parade as it was expected that would be. I felt a kind of anxiety to witness the scene having never attended an execution and yet I felt a kind of horrid dread that made my heart revolt and inclined me to step back rather than support the idea of advancing. On the morning of the execution, she made her intention of going to the frolic and taking me with her, known to our mother, who in the most feeling terms remonstrated against a step at once so rash and unbecoming the true dignity of our sex. How, my daughter, said she, addressing my sister, how can you even think of attending the feast and seeing the unspeakable torments that those poor unfortunate prisoners must inevitably suffer from the hands of our warriors? How can you stand and see them writhing in the warrior's fire, in all the agonies of a slow, a lingering death? How can you think of enduring the sound of their groanings and prayers to the Great Spirit for sudden deliverance from their enemies or from life? And how can you think of conducting to that melancholy spot your poor sister Dikawamis, meaning myself, who has so lately been a prisoner, who has lost her parents and brothers by the hands of the bloody warriors, and who has felt all the horrors of the loss of her freedom in lonesome captivity? Oh, how can you think of making her bleed at the wounds which now are but partially healed? The recollection of her former troubles would deprive us of Dikawamis, and she would depart to the fields of the blessed, where fighting has ceased, and the corn needs no tending, where hunting is easy, the forests delightful, the summers are pleasant, and the winters are mild. Oh, think once, my daughter, how soon you may have a brave brother made prisoner in battle, and sacrificed to feast the ambition of the enemies of his kindred, and leave us to mourn for the loss of a friend, a son and a brother, whose bow brought us venison, and supplied us with blankets. Our task is quite easy at home, and our business needs our attention. With war we have nothing to do. Our husbands and brothers are proud to defend us, and their hearts beat with ardour to meet our proud foes. Oh, stay then, my daughter. Let our warriors alone perform on their victims their customs of war. This speech of our mother had the desired effect. We stayed at home and attended to our domestic concerns. The prisoners, however, were executed by having their heeds taken off, their bodies cut in pieces and shockingly mangled, and then burnt to ashes. They were burnt on the north side of Fallbrook, directly opposite the town which was on the south side, sometime in the month of November, 1759. I spent the winter comfortably, and as agreeably as I could have expected to, in the absence of my kind husband. Spring at length appeared, but Cheninji was yet away. Summer came on, but my husband had not found me. 
Fearful forebodings haunted my imagination, yet I felt confident that his affection for me was so great that if he was alive he would follow me and I should again see him. In the course of the summer, however, I received intelligence that soon after he left me at Yiskawana, he was taken sick and died at Wishto. This was a heavy and an unexpected blow. I was now in my youthful days left a widow, with one son, and entirely dependent on myself for his and my support. My mother and her family gave me all the consolation in their power, and in a few months, nay, grief wore off and I became contented. In a year or two after this, according to my best recollection of the time, the King of England offered a bounty to those who would bring in the prisoners that had been taken in the war, to some military post, where they might be redeemed and set at liberty. John Van Sice, a Dutchman, who had frequently been at our place, and was well acquainted with every prisoner at Genishau, resolved to take me to Niagara, that I might there receive my liberty and he the offered bounty. I was notified of his intention, but as I was fully determined not to be redeemed at that time, especially with his assistance, I carefully watched his movements in order to avoid falling into his hands. It so happened, however, that he saw me alone at work in a cornfield, and thinking probably that he could secure me easily, ran towards me in great haste. I espied him at some distance, and well knowing the amount of his errand, run from him with all the speed I was mistress of, and never once stopped till I reached Gardo. He gave up the chase and returned, but I, fearing that he might be lying in wait for me, stayed three days and three nights in an old cabin at Gardo, and then went back trembling at every step for fear of being apprehended. I got home without difficulty, and soon after, the chiefs in council having learned the cause of my elopement, gave orders that I should not be taken to any military post without my consent, and that, as it was my choice to stay, I should live amongst them quietly and undisturbed. But notwithstanding the will of the chiefs, it was but a few days before the old king of our tribe told one of my Indian brothers that I should be redeemed, and he would take me to Niagara himself. In reply to the old king, my brother said that I should not be given up, but that, as it was my wish, I should stay with the tribe as long as I was pleased to. Upon this a serious quarrel ensued between them, in which my brother frankly told him that sooner than I should be taken by force he would kill me with his own hands. Highly enraged at the old king, my brother came to my sister's house where I resided and informed her of all that had passed respecting me, and that if the old king should attempt to take me, as he firmly believed he would, he would immediately take my life and hazard the consequences. He returned to the old king. As soon as I came in, my sister told me what she had just heard, and what she expected without doubt would befall me. Full of pity and anxious for my preservation, she then directed me to take my child and go into some high weeds at no great distance from the house, and there hide myself and lay still till all was silent in the house. For my brother, she said, would return at evening and let her know the final conclusion of the matter, of which she promised to inform me in the following manner. If I was to be killed, she said she would bake a small cake and lay it at the door, on the outside, in a place that she then pointed out to me. When all was silent in the house I was to creep softly to the door, and if the cake could not be found in the place specified I was to go in. But if the cake was there I was to take my child and go as fast as I possibly could to a large spring on the south side of Samp's Creek, a place that I had often seen, and there wait till I should by some means hear from her. Alarmed for my own safety, I instantly followed her advice and went into the weeds where I lay in a state of the greatest anxiety, till all was silent in the house when I crept to the door and there found, to my great distress, the little cake. I knew my fate was fixed unless I could keep secreted till the storm was over and accordingly crept back to the weeds where my little Thomas lay, took him on my back and laid my course for the spring as fast as my legs would carry me. Thomas was nearly three years old and very large and heavy. I got to the spring early in the morning almost overcome with fatigue and at the same time fearing that I might be pursued and taken, I felt my life an almost insupportable burthen. I sat down with my child at the spring and he and I made a breakfast of the little cake and water of the spring, which I dipped and supped with the only implement which I possessed, my hand. In the morning after I fled, as was expected, the old king came to our house in search of me and to take me off. 
But, as I was not to be found, he gave me up and went to Niagara with the prisoners he had already got into his possession. As soon as the old king was fairly out of the way, my sister told my brother where he could find me. He immediately set out for the spring and found me about noon. The first sight of him made me tremble with the fear of death, but when he came near, so that I could discover his countenance, tears of joy flowed down my cheeks, and I felt such a kind of instant relief as no one can possibly experience, unless when under the absolute sentence of death he receives an unlimited pardon. We were both rejoiced at the event of the old king's project, and after staying at the spring through the night, set out together for home early in the morning. When we got to a cornfield near the town, my brother secreted me till he could go and ascertain how my case stood, and finding that the old king was absent and that all was peaceable, he returned to me and I went home joyfully. Not long after this, my mother went to Johnstown on the Mohawk River, with five prisoners who were redeemed by Sir William Johnson and set at liberty. When my son Thomas was three or four years old, I was married to an Indian, whose name was Hyokatu, commonly called Gardo, by whom I had four daughters and two sons. I named my children principally, after my relatives, from whom I was parted, by calling my girls Jane, Nancy, Betsy and Polly, and the boys John and Jesse. Jane died about twenty-nine years ago, in the month of August, a little before the Great Council at Big Tree, aged about fifteen years. My other daughters are yet living and have families.